there's been a lot of interest in the past probably 20 years now trying to understand how it is that human behavior arises from brain activity. And there's been a lot of progress in terms of understanding this really because our understanding of this one particular brain system, the dopamine system, is really advanced. Um, the dopamine system is a pretty interesting system. There's just about half a million neurons, dopamine neurons, in the human brain, and they're located in a deep structure down in the midbrain. It's really evolutionary old, evolutionarily very old. And these neurons, half a million sounds like a lot, but it's not that many in, in the scheme of the brain where you have hundreds of billions of neurons. Um, so they're just half a million, and, the, and they project from this one old little nucleus of, of cell bodies um, throughout the rest of the brain, and they release this neurotransmitter, dopamine. And it's been known since the 50s that dopamine is really important for um, experiencing pleasure. So if you act, stimulate the system, either electrically with an electrode or chemically with different um, pharmacological agents, then animals find this extremely rewarding, and people do too. So it turns out that every drug of abuse that people use activates the dopamine system, either directly or indirectly. But real advances in understanding the dopamine system came about in the 90s when this um, German um, neuroscientist named Wolfram Schultz did the first ever really direct recordings from these do dopamine neurons. So he implanted an electrode down through a monkey brain and recorded directly from individual dopamine neurons. And he found that they have this really pe peculiar pattern of activity where they signal the presence of a, something that's pleasurable, a reward, but they do so only when the reward um, is unpredictable. So in particular, they seem to signal when errors in, uh, errors in reward prediction. So it's as though you're going on in your life, you're making predictions about how good the world is, and when you're surprised, so things are better than you expected or worse than you had expected, then these dopamine neurons change their firing rate to either increase when things are better than expected or decrease their firing when worse than expected. And then the brain, the concentration of dopamine within the brain reflects this errors in prediction. It's, this is a very effective teaching signal that helps you learn to navigate the world and learn how valuable things are and guide, our, and guide your behavior on the basis of what actually gives rise to um, things that you like. Um, so this, is, this is, takes you through the 90s where all of a sudden now we have a pretty detailed understanding of a really fundamental system that drives our behavior. Um, also in the 90s there was a, an, the emergence of fMRI. So fMRI is functional magnetic resonance imaging. It uses MRI, which is a, you know, a way of taking pictures of the body, but it uses it in a different way to measure blood flow changes. And you can relate these blood flow changes to changes in neural activity. The, the really important thing about fMRI, though, is that it's non-invasive. So you can put a person in an MR scanner and measure blood flow, this surrogate of brain activity, and you can do it in, over and over again. It doesn't do any damage at all. So um, this convergence of fMRI with our understanding of the dopamine system has really led to a tremendous rise in how we understand how people, how behavior emerges from brain activity. Because we know about the system, which gives us strong predictions about where to look in the brain for important signals uh, related to reward. And then you can study people's brain activity as they're doing simple decision-making tasks. And in the, in the early 2000s, there was a huge rise in the number of studies looking at and showing that what we know about dopamine neurons from animal studies also is true in humans. And you can track this by using fMRI and track signals related to dopamine activity directly in the human brain as people are doing any sort of arbitrary tasks. Um, and you know, some of the early studies are pretty simple. So you just say, uh, you know, here's a, here's a task, a little task to do, press a button as fast as you can, and I'll pay you different amounts of money for doing this correctly. And you find that these signals scale with the amount of money you can make. But it's really advanced from there because you can, you can imagine that if different types of signals in, in your world sign are interpreted by you as more or less valuable, and that this is reflected in the brain in a measurable way, then maybe you can do things like predict how much you like different types of cars. So people have done these studies where you show people pictures of cars and you can make predictions about whether which cars they like the best or which they like the worst. One of my old studies from um, 2004, we showed, gave people Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola while they were scanning brain activity, and we can predict which they prefer better in a blind taste test 
um, outside the scanner. And then um, extend this even further to start thinking about marketing questions, what types of products do people like the best. And this has led to a whole new field now of neuromarketing, trying to use our ability to measure this basic reward signal to make predictions about what you like, how you're about to behave, what you prefer in the world, and, and, and um, trying to understand and, and model you know, what it is about the world that, that leads you to like things better than other things. So our ability to measure these reward signals has, has, has spurred you know, big interest in trying to understand what it is about the world that we like and how it is that we make decisions on the basis of how much we value different things. These are really fundamental questions um, for social science in general, um, but in particular for economics. So econ economics really deals with you know, what it is about the world, how do you make predictions about how much people like things, and they capture this in the utility function. And so there's this correspondence between the way we understand about how the, the brain signals the value of things, and then these questions, fundamental interest to how it is that our behavior is guided on the basis of this, that are addressed with economics and, and complicated economic models. And this is the, the basis of this new field of neuroeconomics. Um, where you, you try to use brain scanning and our understanding of the brain, func brain functions, in particular this dopamine system, the way the dopamine system functions. We try to use that to, you know, to get a better understanding of the basics of economic behavior, in particular the, you know, the components of microeconomics. So why is it that people are risk averse, for example? So it turns out that people like things, but they dislike things that are uncertain. And, they, and, they, and there, there's a different level of risk aversion for different people where the amount of risk or the amount of uncertainty gets punished to different degrees for different people. And so some people are very conservative and they want only certain things and other people kind of risk seeking and are the more interesting people in the world. Um, so there's a question, you know, why are different people risk averse? And if you have your finger on some of these basic utility signals in the brain, then you can start trying to understand what it is about how you interpret the world, how, is, how does your brain interpret the world to, try to lead you to be more or less risk averse. Um, so, so that's a, a, a fundamental set of questions that are at the heart of this new field of neuroeconomics. There's also a whole another set of inquiries that just derive directly from my understanding of the dopamine system. So, um, things like drug addiction, which is a, a big problem. It's, um, but there's some fascinating um, unknowns in drug with addiction. So one thing that's known is that it's, not, it's hard to get addicted to things. So only about 15% of people who are, use drugs have the ability to become addicted, and there's no insight into why this is true. But now that we can start looking at the system directly, studying its relationship to behavior, and developing quantitative models about how it functions, the really the advances for addiction are um, really advancing as well. Um, and you know this ability to sort of combine knowledge about the dopamine system with functional brain imaging in people is, is really spurring this along. There are other advances as well um, with MRI. So you can, uh, one new technique you can do is to track how water diffuses in the brain. So you can label water with this magnetic resonance imaging device and then watch what, how it um, travels in different directions. And the connections within our brain, these axonal connections that connect one part of the brain to another, travel in these, in these pathways that are called fascicles, these pathways, these big highways of, of connections. And so they form these sort of, you know, you know streams of big bundles of fibers. And w water within these bundles of fibers can, are restricted in travel. Um, so they can't travel orthogonally to these pathways very well because they're restricted, but they can travel along them very well. And you can measure that and make inferences about the pathways that exist in, in, in a person's brain. You can take a, a beautiful picture of your, of your brain or anybody's brain in about 10 minutes now, and we can track all of these pathways, um, or many of the pathways, um, that, that are really, you know, and we can find how they're connected up to the dopamine system. And this is a, another big area of research in neuroeconomics, is trying to figure out which of these pathways is related to things like risk preferences or ten tendencies, um, you know, preferences for risk or aversion to risk? How do they connect up to the dopamine system? And what does this tell us about the fundamental 
psychological and cognitive processes that lead you to evaluate the world in one way or the other, that lead to these individual differences that we interpret as personality. Yeah, so this, this is really a big new area of inquiry that's at, at the, really at the fusion of many, many fields. Psychology, neuroscience, um, economics, and other social scientists that all sort of are converging together using our ability to measure brain activity really in a detailed manner to start putting to piecing together the components of psychology and cognition that we give rise to our behavior.